page and to examine the words of hope. Uh, Yahweh, uh, the creator God of the universe, laid out an opportunity for us in his Torah, beginning uh, with its uh, opening book called uh, In the Beginning, Barashith, we've renamed it to Genesis, to tell us what he envisioned. And he presented his uh, idea of the ultimate goal in the Garden of Great Joy, uh, known as the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden. And there he, he modeled his covenant the exact kind of conditions that he envisioned for us, for God and us being together as family. And so we have turned our attention to uh, his presentation of Eden and have done so for these uh, past uh, uh, few weeks. Yesterday we examined this statement. Yahweh Almighty caused the man, Adam, to fall deeply asleep. And while he slept, he grasped hold of one of the ribs from his side and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib, uh, Yahweh Almighty, took relationally and beneficially from the man, Adam. He built, he made, uh, he constructed, and he established a woman and wife, an Isha. And he brought her to the man, Adam. And we spent a lot of time yesterday examining each of these words and, and came uh, to realize that by having a woman for Adam, uh, a, uh, a female partner, a marriage partner, someone with whom he could experience being a father through uh, the role of Chawa as mother, that God was creating for us the opportunity to model his covenant. So that even those who did not read his testimony could see in their own families, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, men and women coming together in love for the express purpose of conceiving children, nurturing them, raising them, protecting them, guiding them, instructing them in a loving home. And if you can envision that, which is the, the, the very model of humanity. If you can picture that, you can picture the covenant. Now you know why the universe was created, why life was conceived, why the Torah was authored, why the covenant was offered. That's what God wants. He wants the same thing that we all strive for, a loving marriage, men with woman, woman with man, coming together in love, and a monogamous marriage, building a home and life and family together, raising their children, guiding them, teaching them, nurturing them, enjoying one another as company in a family-oriented relationship. It is the covenant. It is precisely what God envisioned, and he modeled us in that way. Now, there's another reason that from uh, Adam's rib, Chawa was conceived, and we talked about that, that, that in the ancient world, the, the heart was the seat of judgment because that's where you internalized and embraced what you came to know and thus where you understood it. It was the center of uh, the core of your attitude, which then became the, your ability to observe from a proper perspective. But it's also the seat of love where you choose whether or not you wish to engage in a relationship. But there's something else as well. And that is that Adam was unique amongst Homo sapiens. God gave him a nasalma. And that anyone who came from Adam would share that same nasalma. The nasalma is our conscience. It differs from a nefesh soul, which is consciousness, which is the ability of animals to observe and respond to their environment. The nasalma is our conscience, our ability to exercise good judgment, to be moral, to be just, to be discriminating, to make intelligent decisions, to evaluate information so that we understand it, so that free will can be exercised in a meaningful way. And so now Adam could literally experience firsthand the kind of family and love that Yah envisioned through his covenant. We move next to the name statement, and God said, Then the man Adam 
said, uh, this is the foundation for living. He said, esteem, the way to conduct one life, one's life, pa'am, the pattern and behavior to be followed. Out of my essence, life, from my life, this shall be called woman, wife, because out of man and husband, she was taken. She was obtained. So let's think about what well, this was a you know uh, a speech that Yahweh, who is the only witness to this discussion, passed on to us. He said, "This you know, there's a lot of things that were said between uh, Adam and Yahweh, between Adam and Chawa." But God chose certain of these things to say, I'm going to share them with you because that's important for you to know. So this was a, a pretty smart dude, this uh, Adam. You know, he wasn't the um, uh, ignorant in any way, shape, or form. This was his statement. These are his words. It says, then the man, Adam, said, this is the foundation for living. What is he telling him? He's telling exactly what we deduced when we read the previous statement. That, that by having Adam and Chawa together, man and woman, as husband and wife, in a, the model of monogamous marriage, conceiving children and nurturing those children in a protective environment, guiding them, teaching them, instructing them, loving them, enjoying them, that we have the model for the covenant. That's all God cares about. You know, there's so many religious people see God micromanaging every aspect of their lives, and they pray for God to intervene in free will and do all manner of things. He's only interested in one thing. If you're interested in what he's interested in, he is interested in you. If you're not interested in what he's interested in, he pays you no attention. This is the model. It's about family. That's it. It's about children, guiding them, teaching them, enjoying them, raising them, empowering them, uplifting them, enriching their lives. That's the model. Adam said, this is the foundation for living, esteem. The, literally the skeleton upon which life hangs. It's the backbone of everything associated with life. It's the way to conduct one's life, pa'am, the pattern of behavior to be followed. So long as we view marriage as the central focus of our lives and, and prioritize our families and our homes and conceiving and raising children and teaching them the truth, then we are conducting our lives in the manner that Yahweh not only envisioned, but we become living embodiments of his covenant. It's the way to conduct one's life. Out of my essence, life, from my life. You know, the foundation for living, the way to conduct one's life, out of my essence, life, from my life. If you want to live... If that's your goal. I mean, so many people want to have eternal life. They think, you know, that salvation is eternal life. Well, it happens to be a byproduct of the covenant. If you want to live, look at the covenant. That's what he's telling you here. The Christian mythos that you are saved first is completely wrong. The pattern that God has established is engage in the covenant, and as a byproduct of the covenant, you'll live. The source of life, the essence of life, the pattern for living, the way to conduct one's life is in the covenant. God's familial relationship. That's what he's saying here. That is what he is pronouncing here. The covenant comes first. Salvation follows. And he said, this shall be called woman and wife because she is out of man and husband and she that she was taken. Called. Kara. Called. Kara. 
know, car is, is amongst the five or six most important words in the entirety of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms of God's communication to us. It is the basis of Mikra, which are God's invitations for us to be called out and to meet with him. Kara means to invite, to summon, to call out. It means to meet and to welcome. It means to read and recite. When we read and recite Yahweh's word, when we answer his invitations to meet with him, we are welcomed into his company when we respond to what we learn, what we observe. There's only one means to meet with God. It's through his Mikra. And Mikra is based on Kara. And so he is telling us right here that she shall be called out. She shall be invited. And these invitations that, that are going to be based upon her work is going to be the essence of life, the essence of humanity. And they are. There's only one path to God. It is through these seven mikrei, where God invites us to be called out of the world, called into his family to meet with him. Something we capitalize upon when we read and recite his invitations, which we find only in the Torah. And she shall be called Isha. When we study these mikra, what we find is that in four of them, we're specifically invited to come into the presence of the Isha. Why? Because the Isha, this pattern of life, this, this role model for the feminine, maternal aspect of God's nature, the feminine, maternal aspect of his light, Isha is the feminine Hebrew word for fire in addition to being mother, wife, woman. He's describing the role that the set-apart spirit, our spiritual mother, plays in our lives and plays in the development of the covenant, enlightening us, enriching us, clothing us in a garment of light so that we can be adopted into God's family and live in his presence. All of that is being communicated here, and particularly through Isha, where... As I say, in four of the Kara, we are specifically invited to come into the presence of the feminine maternal manifestation of God's light. And so in these words, we learn a great deal so long as we're observant, closely examining and carefully considering what God had to say, because he's bringing our attention to the covenant and how we participate in it. We'll return to Shattering Myths after the commercial break. to uh, the Ghani Den, the protective enclosure that was conducive to life of great joy and satisfaction. We're reminded that the Hebrew term Beireth is uh, based on the Hebrew word and the letter Beath, which is home and family. And so the Beireth, which we uh, call the covenant, is a family-oriented relationship. It is being invited into God's home and to live as a member of his family. That is what God is offering us. There are five conditions that he asks of us if we wish to participate in this family, if we want to enter his home, and there are five benefits that are offered to those who do. Now, we've gone over these conditions and benefits before, but since they are the essence of life, the pattern of life, uh, according to uh, what we have just read, the five conditions, the requirements, if you will, the terms and conditions of the covenant are as follows. The first thing we're asked to do is to walk away from our country, from religion and politics, from Babylon, as it turns out, where Babylon is described as a mixture of religious and political militaristic and economic corruption. God is not going to allow religion and politics, militarism and economic schemes into his home. If that is what you care about, if that's how you define yourself, if that's what you support, you can't have a relationship with God. He will not allow it. So that's the first thing we must do. We must make the decision to, to separate ourselves from the institutions of man so that we are in a position 
to be called apart from society and enter a relationship with God. So religion is not the means to salvation. It is the means that precludes someone from being saved. Second is after we disassociate ourselves from religion and politics, God asks us to trust and rely on him. So instead of trusting your military to keep you free, instead of trusting your government to provide for your substance, your social security, your Medicare, your freedom, as opposed to trusting your government for these things or your religion to provide your salvation, God says, once you leave those things, which I want you to do is trust and rely on me instead. Now, it is not possible to trust someone you do not know. It is not possible to rely on something you do not understand. So inherent in that condition is that you have to come to know Yahweh as he actually is, and you need to come to understand what he is offering. There's only one place that God introduces himself to us. It's in his Torah. There's only one place where God provides a presentation of his covenant, which is what he is offering. And if you want to understand it, you have to read his Torah. The third uh, condition for participating in the Corinth, the 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 covenant is to walk to God to become perfect. God doesn't say, I want you to become perfect and then walk to me. That's not what he says. He says, walk to me and become perfect. Well, there's only one path that's presented in the Torah. There's only one path that is directly associated with the covenant. That path, that way, is the way that begins with the doorway labeled Passover, which is the doorway to eternal life. It crosses the threshold of matzah, which is unyeasted bread, with Yosh himself explaining that the yeast that he is removing from that bread is religious and political corruption. It then, the following day, along that path, leads to Bukhotam, firstborn children, where we are adopted into God's covenant family. This then enables our Heavenly Father and our spiritual mother to empower and enrich us on the oath, the promise of the Shabbat, on seven sevens, Shavuah. Enriching us with teaching and guidance, powering us with the Spirit. That's the path. Those first four, Moed Mikre, have been fulfilled. In other words, those promises of the covenant have been enabled and they are three that are awaiting fulfillment, and we have spoken of them, and we'll speak of them on future days. In fact, Friday we will turn to a presentation of Sukkah, which is the ultimate destination where we are invited into God's home so we can camp out with him forever. So that's the path. That's how we walk to God and become perfect. That is the third requirement of the covenant. So God has given us these invitations, these kara invitations, and he expects us to answer them and to meet with him. The fourth uh, requirement, a condition for participating in the covenant, is to know the covenant, is to understand the covenant, is to observe the covenant, is to closely examine and carefully consider all aspects of the covenant, its conditions and its benefits. Because if you don't know its conditions, you can't capitalize upon them. If you don't know its benefits, there'd be no reason to embrace the covenant. So God wants you to know it so that you can understand it, so you can exercise free will in a reasonable way. Back in a moment. Yes, indeed. There's so much we can learn about uh, Yahweh's uh, covenant. Uh, we were speaking before the break of, of the conditions of the covenant. I had shared with you the first four uh, by uh, repetition, because repetition of the most important offer ever made is certainly in our interest. They are to walk away from religion and politics. Second is to trust and rely upon Yahweh instead, which requires us coming to know who he is. And he is not the Lord. He is not Jesus. His name is Yahweh. And the only place you can come to know him is by reading his Torah. And he says, I want you to rely on me, and that requires you understanding what he is offering, which you will find also in his Torah. The, uh, the third step 
along the way is to walk to God and to become perfect. The path that enables that is uh, provided with the seven mikre, which is why kara was used in that essential formula in the last statement that we read regarding the nature of having man and woman come together to raise a family in Eden, in the home that they were living within. This then leads us to the fourth requirement or condition of the covenant is that you actually know what the covenant is about. God has said emphatically that there is not a second covenant. The Christian concept of a New Testament is completely opposed to God's teaching. If you are a Christian and think that you are living in the New Testament, you are living a lie. The covenant has not yet been renewed. And when it is renewed, the only thing that is different about the renewal of the covenant and its current existence is that the Torah is literally written inside of us. God's teaching becomes the fabric of our lives. Right now, you have the opportunity to reject the covenant. You can ignore the Torah. But when the covenant is renewed, God's Torah is literally written in us. God writes it in us. And that means, my friends, that the covenant has not been renewed. And when it is renewed, it will not be based on the Christian mythos of the gospel of grace. You've been fed a lie by the world's most egregious liar, Paul. And so God says, I want you to know this covenant. If you know this covenant, you've got to know that God only has one of them, that it is the model for living with him, that there's only one way to develop a relationship with him, and it is out of that relationship that we are saved. We are not saved so that we can participate in the relationship. God only saves his children. The fifth requirement to participate in the covenant is that as parents, God asks us to circumcise our sons. And he does so because he knows that if we circumcise our sons every time we bathe them, every time that we nurture them in this way, that we will be reminded that we have made a commitment as the sign of the covenant to raise our children so they will come to know the covenant. That we've made a commitment to teach them the Torah so that our children become God's children and live forever with us and with him. That's the reason he's asked us to circumcise our sons as parents on the eighth day. That's the, those are the conditions of the covenant. There are no more than that. Not a lot of work on our behalf, but we do have to engage. We have to be willing to distance ourselves from the seductions of modern society, from being patriotic and political and religious. We do have to do that. We do have to study Yah's Torah teaching sufficiently to come to know who Yahweh is so we can trust him and to study his Torah sufficiently so we know what he's offering so we can rely upon him. We do need to answer his invitations to meet with him on the seven days that he has outlined that provide the path to our perfection and our admission into his family and into his home. The seven Moed Mikre that Christians universally denounce. The final of those uh, this year will be celebrated beginning tomorrow night. Sukkah, shelters, camping out with God. Then God says, I want you to, uh, to observe my covenant so that you understand the terms and conditions therein, and you also understand the benefits. You know that there are rules in this household. You don't have to pay attention to them. You can ignore them. You just can't be part of my family if you're going to be adverse to my family. You know, if God said, I'm going to save everyone regardless of they're still religious, they're still political, they're still militaristic, they're still involved in, in conniving economic schemes, then heaven would be no different than earth. All of the hells that we perpetrate and the agony we perpetrate on one another would be perpetrated forever. It would just be an eternal hell. And that's the reason why God does not allow the religious or the political or the militaristic or the patriotic into his home. Perpetrating what we are experiencing now would be sadistic. He's not going to do it. And that's in his interest and ours. Then God says, I want you to circumcise your sons as parents on the eighth day as a sign that you're committed to making your family a model of my covenant family so that your children grow up to participate in the covenant, the greatest gift that you can give them. 
Now, God says that for that, there are five benefits. See, if you look, by the way, at the nature of your hand, you'll see that there are five fingers. You look at God's name, and you'll see that there are five hands. Yes, God's name is comprised of five hands. The first letter of God's name is hand. Yod, which was originally called Yod, means hand. It's depicted in the original script that the Torah was written as a, as a upper arm coming down, a forearm reaching out with an open hand to lift us up, just as loving fathers do. And then there are two other people standing in his name, standing up, reaching up, their hands reaching up to for Yahweh to grasp hold of them so that we can stand and walk and engage with God. Those two people are looking up to him, reaching up to him, observing him. And they stand on either side of a tent peg, which was symbolic of securing a home and enlarging a home, and of addition. It's the Hebrew word for and, which means to increase. That's his name. Five hands in his name. There are five conditions of the covenant. There are five benefits of the covenant. The two people that stand in that name are Adam and Chawa because they were the living embodiment of the covenant relationship, this family relationship. They are Abraham and Sarah because they are the first two husbands and wives that became the official certification of commencement of this formalized relationship of the covenant. So what are the five benefits? Look at your hand. That's all you have to do to, to go through the benefits and also the conditions. There's five benefits. You'll find that those five benefits just so happen to have been enabled, fulfilled, those promises honored through the first four mikre, invitations to be called out and meet with God that have been fulfilled in the year 4000 Yah, 33 CE in our pagan calendars. They are? Pesach, Passover, eternal life. God promises to make us immortal. The means to that is Passover. God then says, I will perfect you. The means to that, to have the fungus of religious and political yeast removed from our souls is matzah, unyeasted bread. That is where we become perfect. Not in terms of we no longer are flawed people. Yes, we are. Everyone that God in, engages with in his Torah is flawed. We continue to be flawed people, but not in God's eyes because he himself paid the price by having his soul go to the place of separation to Sheol on our behalf on the mikra of matzah. We become perfect in God's eyes, exonerated, vindicated, righteous when we answer this invitation, one which calls us into the presence of the Isha, the maternal aspect of God's light, into the presence of the set-apart spirit, our spiritual mother. This then enables us to become firstborn children, children born into the first family, Bokurim, adopted into God's family, living with him forever as his sons and daughters, inheriting all that has he has to give, which then leads to the fourth and fifth benefit of the covenant. God promises to enrich us, and he enriches us through his teaching, through his guidance, just as we enrich our children with his love. And then he says, I'm going to empower you. We go from being physical beings to spiritual beings. And in that process, as just as, as light and energy is the same thing as matter, but matter is energy in a hugely reduced state. As we transition from physical beings to spiritual beings, we experience the multiplicitous effect of the speed of light being multiplied by the speed of light is what E equals MC squared is all about. We are empowered. We go from being three-dimensional beings stuck in time to seven-dimensional. We go from, from being restricted in our movements to being unleashed, unlimited, liberated in the most wonderful way possible. Those are the five benefits of the covenant. If you wish to enjoy them, then if you're a Christian, you're going to have to leave your religion. If you define yourself as a Republican, a Democrat, 
a socialist, secular humanist, you're going to have to disavow those allegiances as well. You're going to need to come to know God as he really is and understand what he is offering. You're going to need to walk to him along the invitations that he has provided. You're going to need to understand what he is offering to become a student of this covenant so that you can articulate its conditions and its benefits as readily and as easily and as profoundly as you're hearing them here. Because it's not just about you becoming a member of his family. It's about your children becoming a member of his family. And about your children's children. That's what family members do. They help one another. And you may say that uh, that uh, you wish to embrace these conditions because if you do, you're saved. Okay, that's perhaps all right. But I can suggest that there is something far more wonderful than that. If you invest the time to get to know who Yahweh actually is, you will fall in love with him. God is exactly as we would most want him to be. He's not a Lord that tries to control us, who wants to be worshipped. He is a father that seeks our love and wishes to, to give his children everything that he has because it is by giving his children everything that he has that we and he grow, enjoying our relationship together. He is exactly as we would want him to be, one who talks the talk and walks the walk and wants us to walk with him. In the next statement from uh, the witness to the conditions uh, experienced in Eden, we read, Accordingly, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they shall exist as one flesh. Let me uh, share something with you that I uh, did not say in, uh, in my presentation of the conditions of the covenant. Uh, and it pertains to this particular statement here. God didn't just ask uh, Abraham to walk away from uh, his uh, home, which was uh, Babylon, or of the Chaldeans, or at the, uh, originally was the city-state uh, capital of uh, Summa. Uh, but uh, later uh, was incorporated into what became uh, uh, Babylon. Um, he uh, didn't just uh, ask him to walk away from Babylon, which is uh, his country, uh, religion and politics, uh, because God goes into great lengths to describe what he despises about Babylon and its religion and politics, economic schemes and military adventurism. He, uh, he in the next breath, said, and from your family, from your father, from your father's house. Uh, that is echoed here. It's one of the things that uh, most people who embrace Yah's covenant, that's their first feeling of, uh, of wow, look what I did. Uh, my family is now opposed to me. They think that I've become a nutcase. They think I've become a fanatic. That by taking God's statements uh, to be true by actually trusting the word of God and by uh, accepting what he is offering most families because they are we are so indoctrinated and cultured in religion and politics their first reaction when you do this is to say what are you crazy have you joined a cult you know when God's word and what he is offering is so unpopular it is so estranged from the mainstream of what we are seduced into believing because we live in such a religious and political climate that the first reaction is that your family will disown you and they'll speak ill of you. Now, Yosha said this multiple times. He, he just said, that's what you ought to expect. He says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division. And he was speaking of the division between fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. God says, you know, if you want to be part of his family, you've got to be willing to walk away from the human family. 
a difficult step for a lot of people. Now, I'm going to tell you that the joys of being part of Yahweh's family far outweigh the irritation that you will get from your own family for having chosen to trust and rely upon Yahweh, the creator God of the universe. And ultimately, based upon the joy that you'll find there and the excitement and the enlightenment that you'll find as being part of Yahweh's family, sometimes those who are not completely poisoned by religion or politics will come to join you. And we are living in a time right now where people are beginning to question their religion and politics, realizing that they're not part of the solution but are part of the problem. So today, better than any other time, this is the time to do this. But God does say that if you want to be part of his family, you need to walk, be prepared to walk away from your own family. Now, it's, if, if your mother and father see the joy that becomes part of your life, becomes the purpose that becomes part of your life, and say, you know, I want that, they can follow you to God's family. But you've got to be willing to take that step away. And that's what he's saying here. Accordingly, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they shall exist as one flesh. Now this says many things. One is that Pauline doctrine, the religion of Christianity, the religion of Christianity is based solely upon Paul's letters. And Paul was a Gnostic. Paul, his entire argument is that the flesh is bad, and that his faith is based upon being spiritual. God is saying here, the flesh is good. They shall exist, Haya, they shall be one in the flesh. And I'm going to tell you, the single greatest joy that can be experienced in the flesh is the result of loving husbands and wives coming together, becoming mother and father, and conceiving and raising children. It's the ultimate satisfaction and joy that exists in the flesh. God's saying it's good. He's encouraging it. He wants us to celebrate, to experience the joy of marriage and of being parents and of building a family. Because when we do, we're in a position to understand why we exist and what he is offering us and the role he wants to play in our lives as our father. Then my joy to speak with you today. Look forward to being part of your lives tomorrow. May Yah bless you all.